Good morning and happy Friday, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim McDonald with Torrey Hills Capital. Pleased to be hosting today's webinar featuring Microbix Biosystems, a developer of proprietary biological and technological solutions for human health and well being. And I don't want to take all of Cameron's thunder this morning, but uh, of note, please uh, uh, listen to the following. Company trades in the US on the OTCQX under the ticker symbol, ticker symbol uh, MBXBF, and also in Canada on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol MBX. Uh, and then some financial highlights uh, I will include as follows. Uh, for the fiscal year, which for the company ends September 30th, 2021, Company reported revenue of 18.6 million, uh, which represents a 77% increase over the prior year. And then also for the three months ended December 31st, the company reported revenue of 4.9 million, a 54% increase over the same period the prior year. Uh, joining me today from the company, I've got Cameron Groom, the company's president and CEO. Uh, before I turn the call over to Cameron, just wanna go through logistics. For those who have been on calls with me in the past, um, you're probably familiar with this, but uh, as a reminder, uh, and for those who have never been on a call, uh, our uh, webinars are intended to replicate our in-person meetings, which we like and encourage to be as interactive as possible. With that in mind, uh, if you do have questions along the way, please feel free to ask them. No need to wait until the end of the presentation. Uh, and uh, as a quick reminder, the best way to ask a question is, again, use the navigation pane. Click on the bottom of the screen, click on the Q&A or the chat button. Uh, one of us will see that and get those questions answered for you. Alternatively, uh, if you feel like holding your questions until the end, we will have a more formal Q&A session uh, post uh, presentation, uh, at which time we can actually also unmute uh, you to speak directly with Cameron. Uh, if you want to do that, the best way to do that, of course, is again, use the navigation pane and click on the raise hand button. Uh, we'll see that and unmute your microphone and allow you to have direct conversation back and forth. With that said, uh, I will remove myself from the screen, but remain on the call throughout, uh, moderating questions as they come in. Uh, but for now, we'll turn the controls over to Cameron. Thank you so much, Jim. That's great. Uh, just before I... Uh launch into share screen, I'll, I'll just give a few words of introduction. You know, Microbics is, a, as Jim mentioned, is a key supplier of critical products that support the global diagnostics industry, and specifically in the broad category of infectious diseases testing. And we'll talk a little bit about what those, uh, what those product areas are exactly. We've uh, run rate revenues on the order of 20 million a year now and are firmly profitable already. Uh, we'll be reporting our uh, second quarter of the fiscal year um, in mid-May and that will be our, you know, spoiler alert, that will be our, our sixth consecutive quarter of profitability. We've um, developed a suite, as I mentioned, of important products, and these are moving from ingredients through to sophisticated medical devices products that are driving some very strong growth for us, as Jim mentioned. And that's, uh, of course, growth in sales, along with gross margin expansion as we move into more branded and proprietary products. And we're currently taking steps to support five to 10 fold growth in our top line over the next uh, several years. And we're already fully funded to do so. So very strong balance sheet position as well. So what I'll represent to you effectively, we can um, present some slides to better enable you to scratch the surface of, of making that judgment. Uh, but I'd represent that we're an effectively managed and governed a uh, high growth company that's very much investable. So I uh, urge you to consider things on that basis. And with that, I'll, I'll pull up a slide deck and uh, walk you through a little bit of this. This is the, um, the same deck I'll be presenting, in fact, at the uh, Bloom Burton & Company Healthcare Investor Conference um, next week. 
So uh, let's see if we can move this to full screen. Here we go. So we're very much specialized, as I mentioned, in the diagnostics industry and specifically around infectious disease testing. You know, we don't get involved in, you know, blood chemistry and, uh, you know, enzymes and hormones. We're very much in the field of infectious diseases, which is a major category and covers a very broad spectrum of pathogens, conditions, and, uh, and disease syndromes that we'll go into. Um, of course, everything here is forward-looking. Um, we like brevity over uh, quantity, and this covers the substance of a safe harbor statement quite well. Thank you. So what we are, we operate um, from our base in Canada. We have a, um, a campus of three uh, production facilities, um, administrative, um, manufacturing, QC, and QA as well as some of our customer support functions. And we sell now to customers all over the world, principally in North America and Western Europe, but also in Africa, Asia, Australia, and Scandinavia. And our sales are totaling on the order of um, 20 million per year, as I mentioned earlier. And they fall into three product categories. Um, the highest growth potential of which is our diagnostic test quality assessment products. And I'll go into a little bit of what the heck that means. And these are products that enable you to tell whether tests are actually working properly, which is really important. Um, the last thing you want is inaccurate test results. False negatives have devastating consequences as do false positives. And we've created a suite of very um, unique products to help um, accreditation agencies that monitor the, the competency of the labs and certify them, the people that make tests and the clinical labs conducting tests to help ensure the, their accuracy. We also um, manufacture products to support test sampling and collection, specifically viral transport medium. And I'll go into a little bit about what that is. And um, we're moving forward on both those uh, elements and sales that are uh, breaking through the 5 million a year mark. And then in our sales of ingredients, this is the where the business started historically and where we got all this competence over a long period in working with these different pathogens safely and effectively in providing some critical biological ingredients, the intel inside, as it were, for people to actually manufacture certain categories of tests. And between these three areas, we're very much primed for continuing strong sales growth. We're increasing the pace of our product development activities as Jim alluded to uh, in the preamble is before we started the call, uh, we're very active in presenting data from our products with first class industry collaborators, uh, growing the port breadth of our product portfolio strategically and thereby expanding margins, growing net earnings and ultimately uh, to continue winding the spring uh, to lead to share price appreciation. We've got a great senior management team and um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm privileged to lead this group. I've got over 30 years experience in the life science field in both capital markets and operations. My uh, chief financial officer, Jim Curry, is uh, likewise very experienced in life sciences and very capable. Our chief operating officer, Ken Hughes, the CEO in his own right that returned two microbics to help me with the build, and Phil Caselli, our SVP of Business Development, Sales and Marketing, Mark Lusher, SVP Scientific Affairs, brilliant scientist as well, and a real breadth of talent beneath that, including a number of key opinion leaders within the clinical lab and diagnostics industry that we've also got a great um, and independent dominated board, our chairman is Martin Marino, who comes out of Merck Generics Group and uh, Apotex as senior counsel uh, within those firms. Dr. Peter Bletcher, a prolific entrepreneur in his own right and uh, medical doctor with a tremendous breadth of experience. Mark Cochran, former executive director of Johns Hopkins. 
Vaughn Ebro Panaloni, our audit committee chair, and my predecessor, tremendously experienced Joe Renner, a um, wildly successful entrepreneur in his own right, chairman and co-founder of Zydus Pharmaceuticals, which I believe is about number four in the United States right now in terms of prescriptions filled. And we um, just recently um, had Jennifer Stewart, a uh, very um, driven and talented uh, specialist in government relations join our board um, to assist with government relations and communications, uh, bringing her talents to bear. And of course, I'm also a director of the company as well as being CEO and president. In terms of our capital structure, we are a small cap company and therein of course lies the opportunity with a market capitalization on the order of 70 million reasonable uh, and uh, slowly growing trading liquidity even in light of these circumstances. And as I mentioned, um, it very much already funded. We have uh, currently, last I checked with our CFO, over 13 million Canadian in the bank, an undrawn line of credit for a couple of million more, and uh, certainly very good support from capital markets, uh, government sources, and others. And um, our current ratio is now over six. Our debt to equity ratio is below 0.4, and we're strongly uh, cash flow, EBITDA, and net earnings positive as well, just to, for the avoidance of doubt. We'll go into a little bit of what the trends look like later in this presentation. I mentioned the three business areas we're in. Each, each one of these is, uh, brings to bear some very interesting competencies that are quite synergistic. For our CAPs or quality assessment products, we're expanding that um, category very successfully with uh, three major categories of customers that I'll go into with our viral transport medium, our principal customer is the province of Ontario for whom uh, we've stepped in to be the only qualified domestic supplier of that product. And then our base of long-standing customer relationships in our ingredients business. And we'll touch on exactly ingredients for what, um, but some of those relationships going back decades and uh, gives us tremendous connectivity across these categories. We also have um, three facilities. I mentioned we're very far from a virtual company. Um, we have three adjacent buildings in Mississauga, Ontario, about about 15 or 20 minutes from the Toronto Pearson International Airport, which just gives us uh, tremendous uh, connections for shipping as well as uh, business development work. Um, our three buildings are principally oriented building one at 235. Um, I'm going in the order of, uh, they appear on the street rather than the order of their acquisition, but uh, 235 watt line is the center of production for our quality assessment products. Building two, 265 watt line is the center of our production for our ingredients business where we do all our hot biology. And building three that we have leased uh, last summer and are in the, uh, just in the process of finishing build out renovations to that facility to focus on uh, viral transport medium production, but to add flexible capacity for our quality assessment products as well. And all that work gives us some tremendous connectivity. So this is just uh, about half of the customer and collaborator relationships that we have. And I was um, just thinking about this on a Sunday morning over a coffee. And these are just the ones that most readily pop to mind. And you really see a who's who of the global diagnostics industry, as well as the clinical laboratory and clinical laboratory accreditation industries and really um, gives us a, a tremendous insight into the needs of the industry and contacts with our customers that uh, cross multiple product categories. And you'll see some unfamiliar logos here and some very familiar ones. Um, and you know, happy to address questions around these later. So we talked about quality assessment products and you know, what, what exactly is a, are these? And we, we shortcut as, as CAPs or QAPs because that covers the different regulatory uh, nuances of these products. But what these are, are mimics of a patient sample 
that are very consistent, reliable, stable, and safe. So if you're getting a test, we'll use something everybody's familiar with, such as a COVID test, and that could be a COVID PCR lab-based test or, or PCR point of care even. It could be a rapid antigen test for COVID, or it could be a serology test to measure your antibodies, protective level of antibodies against the virus. When you get one of those tests and you get a positive or a negative result, the first question you should ask is, how do you know? How can you be sure that a, a positive result is really positive and a negative is really negative? Well, the, the answer is you can't unless there is some uh, quality system that's accompanying that to make sure of that fact. You can certainly sample poorly, store or transport the sample poorly to get a negative result. Um, a port in the reader machine could be gummed up, an electrode could be corroded, the reagents could be off or being used in the wrong order, the technician could be making errors. How do you know that those tests are working? Well, the way you do it is by having a known positive or a known and a known negative and using those periodically in your process to establish that the test is actually working. And the absolute best way to do that is to bookend um, runs of samples with a known positive at, at set intervals along with a known negative. So for example, bookending the day, starting a day's run of tests with uh, a known positive and a known negative and ending the day's run with a known positive and a known negative. And it's only if those uh, bookends come up as expected and as they should be, that you can have confidence that the tests in the middle were in fact being run properly and not making mistakes. Otherwise, you are quite literally flying blind. And um, events do occur. We've all read about people, uh, personal personal support workers being sent back into nursing homes, nurses or doctors being sent back into hospitals to treat vulnerable patients when they've actually had a false negative result or communities being locked down because of outbreaks of COVID that maybe weren't real. So what we do is we use all the skills that we've accumulated over 30 years of handling organisms to create those mimics of patient samples in a way that they're um, safe, reliable, and consistent so you can do that quality control role. And we use a whole series of skills to grow the bugs, inactivate them, augment them if we need to with uh, even using synthetic biology to formulate um, the samples, format them, uh, stabilize them, and then, of course, validate all that. You know, if you're talking quality products, you better have a good quality system yourself to do this. And this is what we do. And our products have some very uh, distinct advantages. The performance, whenever we can, we use something that emulates the whole genome of the organism and the whole workflow of the test. We have formats that can be either the liquid vials that you see here or the flocked uh, nasopharyngeal swabs that uh, we've all had stuffed up our nose. The, the very best ones in the world are made by a company called Copan Italia out of Italy near Milan. And uh, Copan is in fact our strategic partner. We're the only company they will work with to create controls on their very special swabs to maximize the uh, accuracy of the loading and unloading of the sample so that the controls do demonstrate whether the tests are working. And that relationship extends even through co-branding and you'll see that uh, red flock in the upper right hand corner uh, flock is their brand red is ours and um, that's the equivalent of you know kleenex q-tip and coca-cola uh, agreeing to co-brand with you in, in the lab space so very important we have also stability so that these are very good we're doing cutting edge work on multiplex tests so you know last year you might have had for example, a test for COVID. This year, you'll probably, if you get tested, uh, certainly in higher end 
uh, healthcare facilities, you're going to be tested for COVID, flu A, flu B, and RSV and other virus simultaneously in 2022. And in 2023, you might be tested for as much as a dozen respiratory viruses simultaneously, really to give that much more accurate diagnosis of um, what might be causing respiratory distress. And that starts to extend through into other categories of syndromes that might be um, urinary tract infections that might be gastrointestinal distress. There's a whole bunch of areas where we're working with leading edge companies, uh, testing companies to support their multiplex tests. And similarly, rather than you know going to the doctor and say, I've got an infected cut and the doctor says, yes, you do. And then you both look blankly at each other and say, what are we gonna do about it? And he says, I don't know, we can try an antibiotic, try this one. What about having a test that says, well, that's a staphylococcal infection. And now let's look at what antibiotics it's susceptible to and resistant to, and then we'll make the prescription decision. That's where the testing is going. And we're already supporting that antimicrobial profiling with controls that can help, that can ensure the accuracy of tests that not only look to type the bacteria, but also to look at its susceptibility or resistance to antibiotics. And we have coarse intellectual property around all this as well. And where this starts to break out is of course into different markets. And it took us a while to learn these. Uh, but we have um, three major markets, uh, categories, but four distinct forms of product offering. One is usually white label and these are sold to the lab accreditation organizations as blinded uh, packages of samples. So they might be um, a package of uh, blinded uh, respiratory samples where, you know, vial coded, uh, you know, A1A might be influenza B and vial 1BC might be COVID Wuhan strain and the next vial might be Omicron. And a lab has to get all of those correct to maintain its certification to do that kind of testing. And we supply all the agencies that watch the labs and gain tremendous intelligence about what works and what doesn't, and how to prepare our samples to properly emulate patient samples. Um, second category we call proceed. These are the uh, controls that are included in kits of uh, test cartridges, for example, that might be uh, supplied by a point of care organization or a point of care uh, a test manufacturer. And what they will do is put uh, one of our controls in a box of every 25 to 50 cartridges. And the user instructions say, you will sacrifice one out of 25 or one out of 50 cartridges to make darn sure that the cartridges, the tests, the operator, and the reagents are all still working properly, and that you catch errors quickly. And that's the key, is you don't want to have a systemic error persisting over a long period. And some of you may have read about a, a lab in England that was neglecting quality system checks of this nature. And in half a million tests that they ran, it was estimated that they um, let um, between 40 and 50,000 patients go back to their jobs with COVID it, to spread the virus to others. And you can only imagine the morbidity and mortality that results in that kind of error. And uh, likewise, you know, we have all suffered in varying ways and degrees from uh, shutdowns of our businesses or our lives uh, as a result of COVID spread in the community, how horrible if that spread was false positives and driving that. We also have our onboard kits, which are uh, sold to qualify new instruments and train customers. Either we get referrals from people like Abbott, Beckton, Dickinson, other companies will buy 
the products directly from us and provide them to their customers where they want more of a white glove uh, experience for people that might be buying a new point of care instrument, for example. For example. And then our fully regulated laboratory controls whereby the clinical lab is using them as an integral part of their quality system. And you can see how the pricing of those go up along with the extent of regulation. And uh, we're selling into all these categories and already have sales on the order of 5 million a year of these products. And we're just getting started. And this is where I start to talk about the scaling of this. Um, we started uh, literally on our swab-based controls, for example, we began to offer those and develop them uh, late in our fiscal 2020. And we sold, you know, about 10,000 units, just sam the first samplings, the first distributor loadings, and then the first trickle of reorders. Um, we sold uh, over 120,000 units in fiscal 2021 and uh, we're cruising the multiples of that and we have multiple customers talking to us about needing hundreds of thousands of units a month um, so we're taking a uh, for example a copan flocked swab that costs tens of cents and we're transforming it into a medical device a test control that's worth tens of dollars and talking about going from tens of thousands of units a month to many hundreds of thousands of units a month at that price, that sort of price point. So that's where we see a big, big growth driver in our business. And then, uh, you know, alongside that, um, we identified an acute need for the transport medium. And the same way you've seen, you know, uh, you've seen the, the swab sampling devices lately a lot more. Uh, people were really never that conscious of the viral transport medium into which those swabs are put. They're snapped off and put into a tube of stuff. Well, that liquid medium preserves the stability of the virus until it can be tested by the lab. Otherwise, um, you know, things like the mucus um, in, your, in your nose start to degrade the virus. That's one of the purposes that it's there for. But if you tested that sample hours or days later, the amount of virus you detect would have little or no bearing to the amount that was originally present. So this is a very specialized uh, medium to stabilize that sample and kill it until it can be tested successfully in the lab. And we flagged early on to province of Ontario, we said supply chains are fragile at the best of time. No one in Canada is making this product. We already make tens of thousands, of, we're making tens of thousands of liters of very complex uh, cell culturing media for our ingredients business. Would you like us to start making viral transport medium? And they said, yes, please. And uh, ultimately provided us with a grant to accelerate our uh, uh, validation and scale up. We created that product and we're able to start offering it to Ontario in uh, very early in 2021, culminated in a first order in April of 2021, a reorder in December 2021. And uh, we've, we've delivered now uh, well north of a couple of million units of viral transport medium and continue to produce. We started at um, 50,000 files a week on a semi-automated system. We double shifted that to 100,000 files a week and we'll be bringing in automation that will allow us to do 50,000 files a day as may be required. Um, and that um, equipment will be arriving and commissioned um, this summer into our third site at 275 Watt. So a lot going on. Um, and then our ingredients business, this is antigens. You know, when I talked about this pre-COVID and I talked about an antigen, people would give me a blank look and go, what the devil is an antigen? Well, now, you know, a lot of us know and we've heard the term, and this is, you know, the, the components of the virus that evoke a response, an antibody response in, in, the, in the body. And uh, antigen testing is when you're looking to see, are there any antigens present? And immunoassays 
are the complement of that. And that's where you're looking for antibodies in your blood to say, have I ever been exposed to that pathogen or do I, do I have enough immunity to that pathogen to be protective? And that's relevant um, in many diseases, particularly those where you exposure um, is relevant to diagnosis. And we make a whole catalog of different antigens and sell them to the manufacturers of immunologic tests. So for example, if um, a doctor wants to assess, does a um, uh, mother-to-be have sufficient immunity to uh, German measles, rubella, for example, that would harm her baby if she got an infection while pregnant, uh, the doctor does a test to assess her antibody levels, determine whether she needs a vaccine booster or might have been recently exposed and shouldn't um, be conceiving at, at that particular time. Um, so we manufacture these ingredients to a whole host of companies that are you know, name brand, in some cases, Fortune 500 companies that make these uh, tests, but you would not see Microbix's name on the label, even though there might be a decades long relationship. And that's where we developed all the expertise in this particular niche, working with these different organisms. And this used to be up until quite recently, 90% of our sales, but that's been falling principally as we grow the other elements of our business. And as we migrate more into the branded innovative proprietary medical devices in our quality assessment products. And that is driving some big growth for us, but we have tremendous capabilities. You're glim glimpsing into one of our labs here, which is a bioreactor lab where we grow in each one of those tabletop units. They'll be um, on the order of $80,000 worth of ingredients grown um, in each one of those. Um, and we have uh, uh, seven of them running at intervals and can swap these out. We have 14,000 square feet facility doing this sort of production using different uh, variety of different techniques. And you start to see the benefit of the transformations we've been affecting in our financial metrics. And uh, we were growing revenues satisfactorily and really poised for some tremendous non-COVID growth when the uh, pandemic broke. And the very breadth of our business meant it was affected because uh, in many cases, doctors weren't seeing patients and patients weren't seeing doctors. So testing went down. We quickly created some leading edge uh, COVID products uh, to recover what was lost between 2021, 2020 and 2021, and are continuing to grow from there as our uh, COVID-related business transforms from just about COVID to the broader respiratory pathogen category in the CAPS business. Uh, other elements continue, and we've really dramatically enhanced our reputation as well. So we'll certainly do north of um, in the 20 to 25 million range of sales this year and position to move dramatically higher, perhaps exiting this year with as much as a 20, as a $10 million Q4 potentially, um, if some of the major contracts we're looking for land. We've seen um, expansion in our gross margins from on the order of 40% to, uh, to north of 60%, as well as a big increase in the absolute number of gross margin dollars, which is of course even more important than the percentage gross margin and um, an expansion likewise in our EBITDA and a tremendous improvement in our current ratio, which in our prior quarter was over five and will likely be over six as we report our uh, Q2 and a debt to equity ratio that's uh, continuing to diminish as we pay down um, uh, some legacy debt associated with the company. So, um, oh, excuse me, I'll uh, go back to that slide. Thank you very much. We do have some equity analyst coverage that, um, that for those that are interested, and uh, I think we'll get one or two more analysts to pick up coverage over the core, over the balance of um, calendar 2022. But looking at our company, we're certainly trading at a considerable discount from any multiple perspective to, uh, to any kind of peer group. 
and uh, with, all, in spite of the fact we have a higher growth rate. Um, so things are going very well for us in that respect. And really where one of the reasons I'm doing these sorts of things with Jim is to drive awareness for the company is uh, we'd be a wildly accretive acquisition for any one of these companies or a whole lot more. And I'd much rather us continue to grow as an independent entity. Uh, and if somebody wants to buy us down the road, I'd rather that be from a, a base price that's multiples of the current share price um, rather than um, end the fund today. So where I'd leave you with, and we'll, we'll try and give you back some of your time and a lot, some good time for questions here, but uh, we've got very strong uh, sales growth that's continuing. We have strong and improving gross margins. We're generating uh, excellent positive cash flow from operations, EBITDA and net earnings. We had a record year across each quarter of fiscal 2021. We had a record Q1 and uh, certainly we're, we're not looking to slow down. Uh, we're well capitalized for all the facilities, systems, improvements and automation upgrades that we're gonna be making over the next year, year and a half. We continue to grow our product offerings. And as Jim alluded earlier, uh, we're presenting uh, product results with just a stunning group of collaborators at different leading edge scientific congresses and continuing to build the visibility of the company and the credibility of the company um, with our client, current clients and prospective clients. We have great opportunities across multiple product lines and um, really ask you to dig a little deeper and, and please consider you know, adding a little bit of microbics into your portfolios. Um, very strong ownership and participation across our management board group, and including myself. Um, so we're riding right alongside you with both upside and downside. So with that, I would um, thank you very much. And, and Jim, I, I typically like to think about the questions rather than read them, um, but um, uh, happy, to, happy to jump into them as well. Sure. And uh, great presentation. Thank you, Cameron. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the questions, if you want me to read them, if it's helpful. You know, I've, I've pulled them up. There aren't that many. So I, I can I can certainly jump into uh, jump into that. Yeah, if, if you want to read um, them. So I'm not sure everyone can see them. So if you want to read them first, that would be great. Perfect. I, I will. Did you want me to identify from whom the questions come or should I just uh, leave that uh, you can, leave that open? OK, you can leave that open if you want. Okay, fair enough. So our first question is, who are your competitors in this space? How often should these tests be run and how often are they run? Very good questions. Um, is this a compliance requirement and are there penalties for non-compliance? Um, so that's a series of questions and I'm gonna address them as such. So, well, there are uh, hundreds of companies in the clinical diagnostic space, there are about a half a dozen working in production of controls of any complexity or quantity of which we are one. So it is a much more rarefied environment um, in terms of the companies doing this sort of work. Um, so uh, uh, some of those companies are uh, larger than microbics, but I would represent that we're creating some real value added in the formatting of our products, um, on, particularly on the Copan flock swabs, the um, complexity of them from a multiplex test point of view and antimicrobial resistance test point of view. And that's what's causing us to quickly gain market share and profile is quite simply doing it better and smarter. Um, where our challenge comes is in ensuring that we can produce at the scale required uh, by some of our customers. So for example, if somebody is selling a million um, test cartridges per month and they want to include controls in every box of 25, well, that means we've got to make 40 thousand controls for them. And if we can't produce the controls, they can't sell the tests. So we've got to make certain that our customers know we can produce and keep up with their demand if it doubles or it triples or they start feeding more and more products over to us. So that's 
something we're very focused on now is making sure we're able to scale. And if you go through our past disclosures, you'll see exactly a number of the things we're doing to make certain of that. Um, and I can provide offline a list of, of, of different companies if you want specific names. Um, how often should these tests be run? Well, in a, in a point of care environment, it's that one in 25 or one in 50 test cartridges. Some people are doing it one in 25, one in 40, one in 50 seem to be acceptable ratios from a, an FDA point of view to get to the um, what's called CLIA waived status, which means uh, that a test can be used in a doctor's office or a clinic or a pharmacy. Um, so very important in the clinical lab, there's more flexibility if the lab is under um, those regulations, under the CLIA regulations, then it's up to the lab director to decide. Um, but there are rules under both uh, FDA and the uh, International Standards Organization governing labs, the 15189 standard that says if third party controls exist, they um, should form a part of your quality system. Now, um, a diligent lab director will run controls every time a technician comes on shift. They will run them certainly once uh, at the start of the day, at the end of the day, and they should run them whenever they change lots of reagent, whenever they change lots of, of uh, other test cartridges or consumables, and whenever they've done a recalibration or maintenance on an instrument. That is best practices. How often they are run is, is quite variable. We've seen even, you know, crusty old lab directors going, I've been doing PCR tests or, you know, since uh, Carrie Mullis invented the damn thing and I don't need to do your damn controls. And, you know, this is, you know, this is like somebody running a, a construction site without safety procedures or, you know, driving a car without a seatbelt. It's, it's, it's all great until something goes horribly wrong. Um, so there are um, potentially uh, the loss of accreditation can occur, uh, direct harm to patients can occur, and um, the, the penalties for that are you might be out of business or somebody might die. Um, but we do see some wild variability, but there, de there tends to be a trend to the uh, regulators in different countries having less and less patience with that and saying, no, you will use these systems or, or there will be more consequences. And we see a progressive tightening of the professionalism and the regulation, but, uh, but it does vary from country to country, lab to lab. Um, I think I've covered can, off that first question, Jim. Can, can I follow up on some of that on the first question? Sure. So going back to the first part of that, where you talked about your competitors, um, and you said that there may be five or six sort of core competitors out there, you know, do they have the same growth and margins that you have? Um, they don't have the same. Uh, we're experiencing higher growth as we're a more recent entrant into this sophisticated realm. Um, there are some other companies in that field specifically. Uh, Thermo Fisher has been involved in controls. Uh, Randox has been involved in controls. Um, Beer Cell would be another one. Um, LGC Standards has been out of the UK, has been involved in that through their Seracare brand. And there's a group called Antilia Scientific in the US that's backed by private equity that's been uh, acquiring some companies in this area uh, rolling up as well. So th these, are, these would be some of, the, uh, some of the bigger ones involved. Oh, and microbiologics would be another one uh, involved in that field. But the, the, you can see that list falls off very, very quickly. This is not a, a list of dozens of companies. Sure. And then if you look at the one that's back sure. by private equity, and I'll use them as the example, but um, if they're doing acquisitions as a roll-up strategy, um, at, you know, at the current level that you're at, you know, plus or minus 20, 25 million in sales, um, do you become a meaningful acquisition to them at this time? Or do you need to get a little bit bigger? Or would you be, you know, significant addition to them? Uh, I'd say... Uh... 
yes, yes, and yes, uh, <laughs> but by by and large, you know, there there are companies that would be very interested in acquiring um, microbics for our ingredients business, for our controls business, and you know, for viral transport media business. Uh, you know, my answer is. Guys, you know, we're not entrenched managers. If you want to come with a with a significant change of control premium, by all means, we'll we'll bring it to the board. Um, but you know, it has to be something significant. Um, you know, we we had forty five percent of our shareholders vote at our last annual general meeting, and uh, the majority of those voted with management because they know what we're doing and and that we're creating value. Uh, but we're not entrenched. And if somebody comes with a serious offer, we'll definitely take it seriously. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, VTM is our only customer in Ontario. Well, no, our only customer isn't Ontario. Um, Ontario, um, we flagged this to them and said, guys, you know, you're going to have a problem. Do you, do you want our help? Would you like our help? And they said, yes. So we've largely danced with the one that rung us, as, as the song goes. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, they bought the vast majority of what we've been able to produce. So, you know, we immediately get the critique, well, hey, wait a minute, you've only got one customer and you go, yeah, but, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna turn down the, their, their orders. So we do have some other uh, smaller customers that are coming in, but the part of the trick on this is being sufficiently strategic in quantities. You know, if, if they're buying as they have most of our production, the majority of our production, you say to somebody, well, you know, I can be a strategic supplier to you and supply, you know, 5% of your need or 2% of your need with my overage. They say, well, thank you, but you're not strategic. So we've got to build out the capacity to a greater level. Um, we'll further bring our costs down at that point. Then we can say to somebody, okay, we can be one of two, three, four strategic level suppliers for you and, you know, provide you hundreds of thousands or millions of units um, per month or per year and uh, broaden that out. And we are starting uh, conversations with other um, customers in the uh, other provinces of Canada, as well as at the federal level. Uh, but as yet, those haven't culminated. So we have, you know, Ontario would be over 90% of our, of our sales of that product category right now. Okay. <clears throat> if you look at what they're using it for, are they primarily sort of a uh, COVID use or there is it spread out? Prim primarily COVID use right now, you know, without prior to COVID, you know, Canada was importing over $50 million. Uh, the estimates that I've read is $55 million a year of viral transport media. And this is used for, you know, a whole uh, variety of, of uh, molecular tests and PCR based tests. So, our medium right now is qualified for use in recovering any virus from a sample. So you can use it for any viral testing, not just COVID. And we're doing some further work to qualify it as a universal transport medium where you could use it to, to stabilize any sample containing any bacteria or any virus or uh, you know, uh, fungal uh, samples as well, et cetera, et cetera. So, but in, in this, it's, it's not what you, what you think, you know, it's what you've done the experiments to prove and, and validate, and it takes time to do that validation. So that's ongoing and that will expand the breadth of usage um, so that our uh, viral transport medium can be used with a whole bunch of medical, different medical samples. But right now that it's predominantly being used for, uh, for COVID. Okay, thank you. Um, questions, two questions. Uh, why are you trading at a discount in your opinion? Um, I, think, I think two reasons. One is, um, uh, you know, size and notional liquidity. You know, if you're a smaller company, you might be trading at a discount uh, because of liquidity, investor liquidity concerns, in spite of the fact you have a higher growth rate uh, than some of you know some more established businesses in in that field. So I think that's that's a big part of it. Um, the other thing I think there's been a big sector rotation away from healthcare and tech into more commodities oriented uh, businesses in you know since the start of the new year. Um, so we're trading pretty close to 52 week lows right now, even though you know we're continuing at a hell of a clip in terms of the growth. 
and that our prospects are getting brighter and brighter. So, you know, I, I can't control what the markets do day to day. I, you know, always joke, it's like a jack in the box. You just keep winding the spring and you don't know when the, you know, the clown pops out of the box. Um, we're just creating that value. And um, we believe that ultimately the market recognizes that value, but the exact timing of when that recognition happens is outside of our control. Um, other question, uh, insider ownership. Uh, insider ownership is, is quite strong. You can go on to the Canadian website, SEDI, S-E-D-I, that uh, discloses all insider ownership and we do quite broadly. Um, between our uh, management and uh, directors and founders, um, we would own about 20% of the stock. Um, I own about uh, 2.4 million shares personally that I bought that I nobody forced me to and uh, nobody's forcing me to hold it. So I've got downside as well as upside. Um, so, you know, I, I will uh, likely be adding another 750,000 shares over the balance of this year, which will take me up to about 3 million shares owned. And uh, we'd be as I said, about close to 20% uh, between board management directors. Uh, institutions would own another 20%, say small cap institutions in uh, principally in Canada, but a few in the US now and, and starting to have a greater number there, a um, couple of meaningful holders uh, south of the border. And I think we'll see that continue to broaden out and uh, move forward. And we've got number of you know high net worth retail investors that are uh, have, have known and, and like what we're doing and you know own own millions of shares each as well yeah just to remind uh, people on today's call if you do have a question use the navigation pane click on the q a or the chat button uh, or click on the raise hand button if you want to speak directly with cameron um just following up on that last question you know looking at valuation you mentioned uh trading at uh, close to or near 52 week lows, um, which, you know, believing that that to be true, um, you know, interestingly, timing wise, operationally, you're probably performing better than the company ever has. Is that a fair statement? That That's very fair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when, when I, when I took over as CEO, we had a gross margin in the mid to high thirties. We're now uh, running at gross margins in excess of 60%. Um, we've we've uh, dramatically increased sales, and the combination of those two will relatively holding the line on SG&A expenses has um, led us to you know have net margins in the ten to twenty percent range and EBITDA margins in uh, you know low twenties to to mid thirties. We're um, we're going to see a bit of conscious expansion in our GNA just as we upgrade systems. So we're moving to. Uh, you know, paperless quality management systems and upgrading our ERP, uh, enterprise resource planning software, uh, really to be able to support a larger uh, scale and greater intensity of operations. And, and those are conscious investments on our part, but not, you know, not uh, uh, GNA bloat, but rather GNA investment that we're making to, uh, to make sure that we can scale without it being so the Lucian chocolate factory, you know, just turn up the speed of the conveyor belt. That's not how it works. So, um, so those are the, those are the things on which we're we're consciously making investments, and uh, we're we're quite convinced shareholders are going to benefit from that. Absolutely. Well, and sticking with the the idea of, of valuation, if I look at 2021, um, I was just pulling up pulling numbers off of the the slide deck that you had up there. EBITDA was roughly around the six million mark. Um, and so based on current market cap of 70 ish million, you know, you're trading at just under 12 times, um, you know, you guys and people can pick a number of where they think, you know, the company should be trading, but you know, you could pick a number between 10 and 20 multiple. So if that's the case, you know, you're trading on the you know, the low end of that multiple, but that's off of 2021, which ended in September of 2021. Um, so as you look at, you know, your EBITDA number for 2022, the slide there already shows a much bigger first quarter, um, you know, perhaps even a little bit more than 3 million, is that, if I'm remembering Yeah, correctly. yeah, oh yeah, ab ab absolutely. I mean, we, we did, you know, 3.2 3 million in, uh, 
in EBITDA or sorry in net earnings last year will will certainly be aim to beat that number by a pretty wide margin this year, and and will be in you know should be in the seven to eight million range for for EBITDA this year, um, for 2022, and you know then we'll. We're, we're aiming right now. We're bouncing at this sort of plus or minus five million a quarter range um, in terms of our top line. And um, as we lock down some of the diagnostic uh, test manufacturer contracts that we're looking for for inclusion of our controls in with their consumables, um, I'd like to see that top line number break out to you know to in in the in the direction of ten million a quarter. Um, you know, as soon as Q4 of our fiscal year, which is the quarter ended September 30th. So, um, so we're, we're definitely driving hard at some, at some very substantial growth. And, you know, when, when you start to see a company moving, you know, moving from sales of, you know, let's jump from sales of 10 million to sales of 20 million and, and positioning to move from 20 to 100, um, that's some significant growth. And that's, that's what we're all about right now. We've got, well, we've got products, we've got the customer relationships. We just need to make damn sure we have the capacity. Yep. Um, I think for people on today's call, the timing is perfect. Uh, again, you are, you know, near at or near your lows, uh, operationally better than ever. Um, last question, I'm not sure it was asked today, but uh, cash or cash on hand, will you need to raise any money in the near term? No, 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 we will not. Um, no. We're, uh, we're generating cash in spite of an aggressive CapEx program. Uh, and if anything, you know, we, we'd be considering, you know, if, if our shares keep declining, we'll be considering buy back share, buying back shares rather than issuing new shares. Okay. Um, well, you know, so far, uh, for what I'm hearing, it uh, all seems like a compelling investment opportunity. So let me ask you perhaps a final question. Um, what are your concerns or what keeps you up at night with regarding the business? Um, I think our customer supply chains concern me. That That's already cost us some delays where, um, you know, customers couldn't get chips to, to make, uh, you know, test equipment or readers um, or, you know, other other consumable elements. So supply chain concerns me and inflation, inflationary pressures concern me. It, it worries me that, um, you know, policymakers are, are trying to suppress demand rather than, you know, with high, heightened interest rates rather than unlock supply. Um, so that concerns me. And then, you know, our uh, just making sure that we're scaling and we're not going to disappoint any customer um, and are able to deliver the quantities of product that they're going to require. So th those would be the three things that, you know, uh, two external and one internal that I'm, I'm focused on. Okay, well, great answers. Um, appreciate that. Uh, I do see that we're bumping up close to our one hour mark. So let me uh, do a couple of things here. First, let me thank you for a great presentation and for uh, uh, addressing all the questions that came up. Uh, for the audience today, thank you for attending. Thank you for your questions. Um, and for your benefit, uh, today's keyword, uh, always something topical, of whatever the day is, today is actually hairball awareness. So for those people with cats and other reasons that cause hairballs, uh, today is hairball awareness and hairball will be our keyword. Um, if maybe I turn it back to you, Cameron. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just looking looking at my bald pate and, and uh, thinking about the hairball word. Uh, people will now remember that. Um, <laughs> So, uh, well, I, I just want to thank everybody for spending an hour with us today. Greatly appreciated. And, you know, do do have a, a dive, uh, a lot of good materials on our website, https colon double front slash microbics.com. And uh, just, you know, consider us as, a, as an appropriate part of a, a growth oriented port portfolio. And uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me or Jim if you have any follow up questions. It'd be our great pleasure to answer them. Terrific. Cameron, thank you. Uh, everybody have a great weekend. Uh, we'll keep everyone up to date on the company's progress going forward. Great. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Cameron. Okay. Bye-bye.